if you recall this week, we've been looking at this um, rectangle, which has variable density. And then we started carving pieces out of our little rectangle with lines and with parabolas. Ooh, I should have done an exponential. That would have been different. <clears throat> And the principle was always the same. Mass is equal to density times length times width. So the idea was the same all throughout. Mass is equal to density times length times width. Mass is dense was density times length times width. The integration maneuver, since we're trying to multiply things that aren't constant, trying to multiply things that are continuously variable, the integration maneuver is to pick a spot and assume that the variable factors are constant for a little while. So for the density listed as one plus 0.4 xi, we mark where the density is constant. So the density is constant where the x's are all the same. So at this one x value, that density is constant. Then the idea is we just use that density for some small chain in x. The density varies with x. So we just say that that density won't change very much for some small change, delta x. <clears throat> but it started with marking where the density is constant. In the case of our density marked the other way, <clears throat> define the other way, two minus 0.5 y. Now our density is a function of y. So when we mark where the density is constant, the density is constant on all those uh, points along that horizontal line. But mechanically, we do the same thing. If the density is constant at that horizontal line, I'm going to use that same density for some small change in y. Because if uh, the density is a continuous function and delta y is small enough, the values will be close together. So in this first one, we had mass is density. <clears throat> the length was the constant three or the difference in the functions when we had the triangle or the parabola. And the width is the delta x. So here we have the length. But where with two minus 0.5 yi as uh, my density, So all along that width w, the density is the same, we just use that for the small change in y. Then we get to multiply density times area, density times length times width. So then we look at the question yesterday, what if my density is not just varying with x or varying with y. What if my density changes with x and y? What if my density is a function of x and y? So I can't draw a horizontal or a vertical line 
my density is constant only at that point. My density is constant only at that point. So I can't draw a horizontal line where the density is the, is the same at that every point on that horizontal line. There's no vertical line where the density is the same at all the points on the vertical line. The density is only constant at that point. Unsurprisingly, what we do in this situation is exactly the same thing that we did in the other situation. We just do it twice. This density only works for this one little point. So I'm going to use this density not only for some small change in x, but also for some small change in y, and just use that density throughout that whole tiny area. So I'm not only going to be using this density for some small change in x, we are also going to use this density for some small change in y. So we're gonna make a little box and use the density for that whole box. And our calculation is the same calculation that we had in the previous two examples. Density times length times width. In the first example, the density is one plus 0.4 X. The length was a constant three and the width was Delta X. Oh, let's just write the integrals because we need to think about those. And the width was Delta X. And then we integrate over all the values of x where the rectangle is. So that'll be x equals zero to x equals five. <clears throat> That's the integral for that first rectangle. In the second rectangle, we made the same calculation. We said density times length times width. So the density in the second rectangle is two minus 0.5y. The width in this case is a, con uh, sorry, the length is the delta y. And in this case, the width is a constant five. Then we add up all of the, uh, the rec all of these masses wherever the rectangle is, and the rectangle covers y equals zero to y equals three. So when we look at the, other, the third example, where the density is variable not only in the x direction, but also in the y direction, we just use that density for some small change in x and for some small change in y, and our calculation works the same. I take the density times the length times the width. and we integrate. One of the things that we want to focus on today 
is that the integral is telling us what values to plug into the expression. The integral is telling us what values we plug into the expression. I got to plug two sets of values into the expression, a range for the y's and a range for the x's. So the y's go from zero to three. But then I'm just going to have to integrate my expression again because I got to plug in some x values. The x's go from zero to five. In all three calculations, we did the same thing. Mass is density times area. Density times length times width. In the first two examples, we were able to write the problem in terms of one variable because the density varied only with one variable. In this third example, the density is varying not just with X and not just with Y, but our strategy is the same. We're gonna make the density constant for some small change in length. And in this case, since it matters, also some small change in width. Is everybody okay? So this one is called a double integral. It's like after calculus, we got much less creative with what we call things. It's an integral, but there are two of them. Let's call it a double integral. If there are three of them, we'll call it a triple integral. We used to come up with names for things, like the coordinates. Right now, we're all bored. We just say x coordinate and y coordinate. Yawn. But we used to have names for those things. One was the abscissa, the other one was the ordinate. Now, it's not really critical that you know which is which because I don't even remember. I looked it up yesterday, I still don't remember. So now we just come up with more descriptive, yet less creative names. This is, not, this is a multivariable calculus thing. This is something that you only have to worry about in Calc 3. But building the understanding of double integrals in Calc 3 starts with understanding integrals in general. And that's what we're trying to do. This goes much farther than subs, uh, substitution or parts or trig subs or any of that other bullshit. This is about understanding what we can do with integration. A lot of times in a math class, especially, and actually only ever in a math class, the only time this ever comes up is in the math class. But students are like, oh, what am I ever going to use this for? As if we're here for you. We ain't here for you, we're here for us. So that's beside the point. But the question is, when am I ever going to need to do this? When am I going to need to know this? And the answer is, I don't know, you tell me. You've got to take the information that you get, the skills that you learn, take them out into the world and find where they're useful. If all I do is tell you what they've been used for in the past, I'm doing you a disservice because those are problems that have already been solved. You know what I mean? These are problems that already have been solved. I want you all to be prepared 
to solve the problems in the future. So when we do math problems, even though we're just solving problems that have already been solved, we're also learning the history of things that we know as a species. Any questions? So, some of you are going to be going on to multivariate calculus because it'll be required of you. And some of you will do it just because it sounds interesting. I'm not going to hold my breath for anybody to show up. It's like, oh, I'm just here in Calc 3 for the S's and G's. But that understanding starts with our understanding of what integration is all about. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. So therefore, integration is just addition. Let's take a look at what these symbols represent. In general, what we're looking at is the integral symbol, and then there's some set attached to the integral symbol. All the x's from zero to five, all the y's from zero to three. In our double integral, we just had to list two of them. The set is all the x's between zero and five and all the y's between zero and three. The integral is just telling you what to plug in. The rest of it is the expression into which you plug in the set. So there's some expression over here. And so what we do is we evaluate the expression at all the points in the set that add up the results. Evaluate, <clears throat> evaluate the expression at all the points in the set that add up the results. This part is fishy. So I'm saying evaluate the expression at all the points in the set. And the question is, well, how do we do that? Because the expression is changing continuously. That is the set is not countable. It's not a discrete list of things.
And so that's why we get into all these details about calculus and how to evaluate integrals with all of our techniques. But this is what we want to take away from integration. When we think about integration, forget substitution parts and all that other BS. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is variable. Ultimately, integration is addition. These integral symbols just tell you to evaluate an expression at all the points in the set and then add the results. In our density example, evaluate this expression, the one plus 0.4 X times three times dx. Just evaluate that expression at all the values of X between zero and five and add up the results. If we think of it that way, then we can see what this double integral is asking us to do. Evaluate this expression, which is a new one for us. It's a function of two variables times a dy and a dx. So we're going to be plugging in a bunch of x values, and we're going to plug in a bunch of y values. But that's all the integral is telling us to do. Evaluate the expression for all the points listed in the set. Are they just x's? Maybe if they're, even if they're x's and y's. And then add up the results. Any questions? How's everybody okay? This sounds very fancy. Here's the better news. This problem, which has snuck its way in here for multivariable calculus, because I also have a section of Calc 3. I can't just, I can't help just teaching both classes at the same time in each class. Here's the other part. You already know how to calculate this double integral. If instead of having a function of x and y, if instead of doing that, I actually had a function like one plus 0.4 x, you would know how to calculate it. We already know how to calculate these by hand. It might be surprising for you to find out that this thing from Calc 3, this renegade problem that snuck its way into Calc, Calc 3, the security gap is the hole in my memory where I can't keep the classes organized. And so I just start doing Calc 3 and Calc 2. So that's the security gap. You already know how to do it. If I put one in front of you with actual function, you would know what to do. In the same way that if I ask you to integrate, if I ask you to integrate from zero to five, um, three times one plus 0.4 x dx. We know what to do. First of all, we need to leave the three out or we just multiply it in since we're going to go for terms anyway. So three plus three times 0.4 is 1.2 X. So then we integrate three X plus 0.6 X squared evaluated from zero to five. So three times five minus 0.6 times five squared. What's 0.6 of five squared? 25 times 0 0.6, 25, six is above 25, no, above 50. So uh, I'm not gonna be able to do it. I already lost the numbers. How come I got zero? So three.
Oh, it's not it's not minus, it's plus. Ugh, sign error, they get you every time. I have no question that y'all would know what to do with this integral. I have some questions about whether I know what to do or not. But eventually I sorted it out. All we're doing is saying evaluate this expression with all the x's from zero to five and add up the results. Apparently the answer is three. If we look at that double integral, where the x's go from zero to five, and the y's go from zero to three, if we just replace the density f at x, y with the density that we have here, one plus 0.4 X, that was the density. EY DX. There's two integrals. We should assume that we have to do both. We should hope that we could just do one at a time. So you have a expression, you have two integrals. We're gonna have to assume that we're gonna have to integrate twice because we have to deal with both of them. Our hope is that we don't have to do anything weird. We can just do one, then the other. Hopefully we can just do them in sequence. So which integral would you do first, a dy or a dx? Just the way that is written. Think about order of operations. So the way that this one is written, the first thing that we'll want to do is integrate the d with respect to y. If y is the variable, then this expression one plus 0.4x, that's constant. There are no y's here. This expression is constant with respect to y. As far as y is concerned, the y looks at this expression says, nothing changes. Does that make sense with the way that the, where this one plus 0.4x came from? I'm gonna use this density, one plus 0.4x, for all these different y values. The variable y looks at this expression and says, well, that's just constant. So one plus 0.4 X is constant with respect to Y. So if one point plus 0.4 X is constant with respect to Y, it's just like we're looking at like a 10. The integral of 10 dy is just Y. So when I integrate one plus 0.4 X with respect to Y, it's that constant times Y. And then we evaluate from zero to three.
And since that term is zero, notice that this leads to the same integral that we had before. So once we get rid of this term, We're back to where we started. So this raises a question. What if we, in our original formulation, didn't say area is equal to length times width, we went the other direction or just the other order. Area is width times length. Oops, I spelled Y wrong. There are no X's in the standard spelling of Y. So now our first integral is X going from zero to five. And our second integral is Y going from zero to three. So now if we integrate DX first, Kind of a inside out thinking. Notice that the steps that we're doing are all going to be the same. So I integrate one plus 0.4x dx and I get x plus 0.2 x squared evaluated from zero to five. So we plug in the five and we plug in the zero. but we still have left to integrate dy. Now that we've plugged in five, this is just constant. we got the same thing that we got calculating it with a single integral. And moreover, mechanically, we just have to think about what's the variable. And then the other variable is constant. Good question. In all three examples, the setup was the same. Mass is equal to density times area. Area is equal to length times width, so mass is equal to density times length times width.
How's everybody okay? This is how we want to think about integration. So we need to know what the applications of integration are. First place we should go are the applications of multiplication. We just take any multiplication problem, make one of the factors variable. Area is equal to length times width, but we make the length all variable. We usually make it in terms of a function, which makes our future setting up integrals more difficult. That's all right, we get through it. Integrate the length over the width. Distance is equal to rate times time, but our rate is variable. Integrate the rate over time. Work is equal to force times distance, but the force is variable. Integrate the force over the distance. Questions? Comments? Deep ball? This is what I want you thinking about when you think about integration. Integration should conjure images of multiplication and addition, not substitution and parts. Question? So it's like so you take the length characteristic of, like I guess in that first one, you take the length characteristic of y, multiply it by mass, uh, and then you take it again for x. Yes. So um, if we think about the the so we're, we're, if we get back into the mass is equal to density times length times width. So if the density and the length and the width are all constant, density was a constant too, I get to multiply that density by the length and the width and we came up with 30 grams. In this case, I have the density, the length and the width. One of those three things is constant. The length was the same all throughout. The density was continuously variable. So the way that we um, multiply by the density is to integrate the density over the width. The length was always just constant. How do we plug in this density? Because it's continuously variable. And this is how we plug in that density. We integrate from zero to five. Does that make sense? That's another way to think about it. How do we evaluate? Imagine the other weird questions that we ask once we start dealing with things like infinity and calculus and limits. We think, sometimes we'll think that one divided by zero is infinity or negative infinity. It's undefined, but it's really tempting to just say one divided by zero is infinity. How can we make that idea rigorous? We can't plug in infinity into expre an expression. Infinity is not a number that we can just plug into an expression. So we replace that with limits so that our math can be rigorous. But we're really just still thinking, let's plug in infinity. But we know it'd be embarrassing if we're like all, e to the negative infinity is equal to zero. We write this down, people will look at us like, oh, what's wrong with you? Infinity isn't a number. You can't just plug it into an expression like that. And you're like, oh, ugh, fine, the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative x is equal to zero. And then when you turn around and say, well, how do you get zero? They say, well, I plug in infinity. They go, but we can't just say plug in infinity. That's not okay. How do we plug in infinity? We do this weird limit thing. And then we're like all oh, rigorous. How do we multiply by this stupid continuously variable density? We integrate the density over all the values. 
How do we plug into the uh, density of two, uh, that's a function of two variables? We integrate that density over the two variables that it depends on, Ooh, on which it depends. I mean, if I'm not gonna be able to allow myself to say, plug in infinity or multiply by this continuously variable thing, I'm just kidding. It's perfectly okay to end the sentence with a preposition. Any questions? All right. So that's how we want to think about integration. How do I plug in if the density or if one of my factors is continuously variable? We integrate. Whatever that, wherever that variable is going, we integrate over those variables. If the integral, if the variation just depends on one factor, then I only need to integrate over one variable. If my variability is in two variables, then I just have to integrate over both of them. That's how we plug in when one of the things is changing. That's what integration is all about. All right, that's what I want you thinking about for thinking about integration. That's gonna do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.